Thank you, Anthony, for this remarkable journey. Someone once said that the future is not some place out there. It's the journey that we take, and the journey changes the destination and also you. And I think we in Penang are at that critical stage. The world is also at a very critical stage. Uh, we have only a short time, but the good news is that uh, Anthony is going to be here for a couple of years, hopefully. And uh, uh, we have enticed him also to make Penang one of the bases with which we will have collaboration with several institutions in, uh, in Penang, uh, because we see straight away many, many opportunities for being a leader uh, in carrying out the kind of imagination uh, that he was uh, talking about. For today, uh, the authorities have informed me that we can only have about 15 minutes of Q&A, but we have his email address. Uh, we are having uh, a, a major by the world's leading futurist, the World Federation of Future Studies, are having a three-day workshop in Penang at the end of this month about futures in cities. And uh, we still have some vacancies. Uh, for those of you who are interested uh, in it, you can contact uh, Think City uh, or contact me. And uh, we'll be very happy to accept people who are from citizens' organizations, from government agencies, from academia, for all. Because one of the things that we have realized, if you're going to think of a future, we need a holistic, complete approach from different sectors. Uh, we don't need just the planners to think or just one group to think. Uh, we need that kind of thing. So please uh, give your name uh, and uh, give your question uh, directly. If you have a comment, make it brief. Otherwise, we'll let you know where Speaker's Corner is. It's open every Sunday. Uh, or you can write to us and invite you to give a lecture uh, on a separate occasion. Yeah? So please, yes. Anybody? Yes. Yeah. Name, Rab organization, if any. Ravinder Singh. Yeah. I'm with the Consumers Association, Pinay. Okay. We talk of healthy communities, you know, physical activity, making healthy places, and so on. But as I go around and look what's happening, our development, the kind of development, Yes, we seem to be neglecting our children very much. Mm -hmm. Children need places to run and play. And these have to be close to their homes, not miles away. People who live in detached houses, in landed properties, no problem. They have some place for children to run around. But people who live in apartments, especially the low-cost apartments, medium low-cost apartments, there's no place close by where the children can come down spend half an hour, one hour running around playing. And running and playing, and this is a very, very important part of a child's life in growing up. Yes? Now, I saw the rifle range is a very high density area. There were some government quarters around there. They have been demolished, and the whole thing is turned into a big car park. So it's as if we love our cars more than we love our children. Yeah. yeah. And then again, yeah, we talk about obesity. That one was said there are more obese people in the world today than there are poor people. Yes, again we look at the children. We need to start with them when they're very, very young. We've got to give them the right information, right training and so on. Otherwise it's like fighting fire. When the fire has started and then we take the hose and start putting out the fire. But we're not preventing the thing. So we need to think a lot about all these things. Yes, yes. hopefully, you know, people will start thinking and imagining about these things and uh, do something about children. Children, please. Yes. Yeah, we need to train them, we need to educate them, we need to... Even the environment, you go to the schools, they are not teaching children to keep their own environment clean. The classrooms will be dirty and the teachers are teaching in the classroom. Yes. Now, how can that be? Yeah. You know? Thank you. Yeah. He's a 40 years an environmentalist. Yeah. Shall, shall I respond yes, to that? Because yes, I, I, think, I think this is a really important point and one of my uh, close colleagues always says that if we develop our cities in ways that are friendly for children, they'll be good for us all. And uh, absolutely, as we move to this more compact way of developing more apartments, which is not necessarily a bad thing, so long as we make provision for places to play 
and to enable children uh, to free range. As, our, as we'd like our chickens to free range before, before we eat them, we need the children to free range and not wrap them up in the bubble wrap in the city and have them just watching television in the big family room. They need to, be, to feel safe to be out in the city. And it doesn't all have to be parklands. You know, if the streets and the footpaths are safe places to be, then kids can use that as part of their exploring and their imagination. It doesn't all have to be organised play in a park. It, it's really about rethinking the city to make it more habitable for us all. There is also a, a, a global initiative on uh, child-friendly cities. And the world's textbook on it was published in Malaysia. Yeah? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, in Kuala Lumpur, any one of you is interested, uh, we'll be very happy to give you. It's also the country that didn't pay much attention to that book which they published. Yeah? Uh, but I'll let you have it, anyone who is interested. Yeah? This is one of our problems. Yeah? Like we are the third largest producer of solar energy in the world, but we're one of the useless users of it. You know? uh, still. Yes, please. Um, good evening. Professor Anthony, yeah. my name is Sue Hui. I'm a, actually a state elected state representative of Penang, a member of the state assembly. Um, thank you for uh, and piecing it together so nicely the relationship between health and our built environment. Um, I think it comes as a, as a at a good time when um, you know we've got problems with obesity that's related to. Uh, partly to the design of cities, that in, uh, the high usage of cars and, and the, the poor walkability of cities. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, now we're facing drought in, in January. Uh, we had abnormally low temperatures. So we went from abnormally low temperature to abnormally high temperature. Um, but at the same, and, and, and then there are all the effects of that with regards to um, extreme weathers affecting old people, extreme weathers affecting uh, mos mosquitoes, dengue, malaria, um, extreme weathers affecting plant crops. Um, but uh, the awareness of uh, climate change, uh, the importance of city design towards health, um, is something that I feel is poorly understood um, amongst the, the general public in Malaysia. And I've been thinking for a long time um, how we could change this. Um, and you know, besides having uh, more state leaders speaking up on this topic, the other thing that came to mind was that um, more doctors should be speaking up on this. Uh, the reason is because I think in our society, in many societies, doctors are viewed to be you know, experts, someone you listen to, someone you look up to. And I've seen in many other countries, medical associations, doctors associations, coming up together collectively, speaking up about climate change, speaking up about the, the importance of, of you know, uh, different policies, including the, our built environment on health. Um, uh, would you be able to comment on how um, doctors in Malaysia or doctors in Penang in particular could perhaps play a role in this? Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. I think that was a very eloquent uh, summary of the challenge, the opportunity, and uh, raising that important question about where uh, do people like me and uh, my colleagues here today, where do we fit in and what can we do? Now, clearly, some of us, like me, uh, uh, I'm actually paid to do this as a job, and I've previously been a director of public health and, and would speak out on these uh, issues in Australia. But as you say, you know, all doctors are important leaders in the community, and there's a real opportunity for us as a profession to be organised and engaged on these topics. And uh, through medical associations and professional colleges, um, in, including uh, uh, Penang Medical College uh, here, there's certainly many opportunities for us to improve what we're doing. Because unless we speak out, we're going to be leaving a, her a future heritage for next generations that's not a positive urban heritage. It won't be like uh, uh, the, the wonderful UNESCO village here. It could end up being this very car-reliant, very unhealthy place. And the only reason we've got that is because energy's so cheap at this time. You know, as, as we go to peak oil and beyond, energy will become more expensive again and we'll be stuck with these patterns. And so the health professions need to mobilise, they need to organise, and, uh, and I'm happy to, to chat uh, perhaps uh, in the context of the symposium tomorrow about some specific things that we might uh, be able to do together.
So thanks for that, that really important comment and question. Yeah, uh, I'm, uh, a call. I, I'm a doctor, so I'll try to re reply to our last speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, in Penang, actually they can't walk. I'm a Ko Chong Tuan, uh, I'm a pediatrician. In Penang, you can't walk. The roads are widened yeah. to let more car flow, mm. flow, to, uh, flow through. So the pavement, was, you, there's either no pavement or the pavement is so poorly designed that you can't walk. You, you have to walk on the road and get yourself knocked down. And the pavements are uneven and there are signboards put across. Uh, these are all uh, unauthorized signboards put across the pavement, mm. and directional sign to this hospital, to that hospital, you block. So <laughs> there is no way you can tr you try to put somebody on a wheelchair and walk from the Comta end of Bacchus Road to uh, YMCA. There's no way you can walk mm. decently. Uh, so it's not, it's the authority has a problem. Uh, you are making space for cars and forget about pedestrians. And you want people to walk, it must make it conducive. There must be shade from the sun, yeah. from the rain, uh, and make the pavement safe and, and broad. Yeah, I, this is a really important uh, question. Uh, it really, the priority that we give in terms of our space and cities for the car, and I think this, this theme connects those last three points, that when we're not making uh, a priority for the people, the children in the city, we're making the priority for the car, and we're gradually pushing those sidewalks further and further, narrower, uh, making it less healthy for people. Less, it's less appealing to walk because of local side stream pollution, risk of injury. And it's people like um, Jan Gell, the uh, urban planner from Denmark. He's shown us in the 1970s how you can rethink the city and push back the car. And if anybody's had an opportunity to visit Copenhagen in recent years, it's a wonderful, walkable place. And they have severe climate too. It's too cold and it snows, but people get on their bikes. And so, you know, you can, it's, we can't use the climate as an excuse. We need to reclaim the city for the people. Enjoyed your workshop very much. My name is Marie Lee from San Francisco. I'm the granddaughter of Dr. Wu Tech. I would like to hear I really enjoyed your uh, lecture. And I have some questions, because I travel a lot. You mentioned about exercising, and I do ballroom dancing. You talk about how to you know, have physical exercises, and I do Argentine tango. I will go to Argentine uh, to learn ballroom dancing and Argentine tango for two weeks. And without even on diet, I lost 18 pounds mm, last March. Yes. And I'm going next Sunday. <laughs> so I'd like to ask you, because in Japan, many Japanese people eat fish. And their longevity rate is very high. Would you start by planning and promoting for a better diet? for people to eat around the world? Because if you walk around the world, in Spain and Italy, the fattest one are the Americans. I came from San Francisco, so I'll say this. If they're walking like this, they're from America. If they're slim, they're Spanish and they're Italian. It's very sad to see people are walking sideways and not walking straight. As I went to Buenos Aires, I have been there five times, their diet is mainly meat. Yes. And on their dishes, there's no vegetable. I would think that maybe we should think about what we should be eating and a better diet. And yeah. so not only we'll be eating well, but our longevity rate will be higher. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful uh, comment and question. I mean. This, this is the essence of, of what our challenge is. You know, how can we think about our cities and more generally about the way we live so that we do it in healthy ways? And whether it's the food we're eating, you know, vegetable rich, yes, indeed, more fish. So that uh, fish farming, there's a fish center, I think, here, isn't there? The world fish is, uh, is, is here in Penang. And, Oh, right. Very good. Well, we, um, I was recently in touch with them because we've got a symposium coming up at, uh, down at the Institute in Kuala Lumpur about this broader question of sustainable food systems. And I think that fish and fish farming uh, is a real opportunity for us from a health point of view. 
fish and vegetables need to be much more central in the diet, less of that meat. Argentines, absolutely, like Australians and New Zealanders, way too much red meat, very high rates of uh, bowel cancer uh, in, in many of those countries as a result of that. So it, it's, uh, th there's no doubt that we need to both tackle the, what's coming into the body, the intake, the food side, as well as what's going out in terms of the energy account and getting more active. Dancing, absolutely. Dancing and music in cities. It's, it's not such a common thing in an English-speaking country, but as you point out, in Latin American countries, South America, the whole culture of um, our physical activity and music and promenading, it, it's just a more active way of living. So we need to learn cross-culturally about that. Yeah.